Hey friends, we are about to talk about the area model and the distributive property, specifically as it relates to third grade, but it also relates to fourth and fifth grade. This is work that uh, matters to both of those grades or all three of those grades. So I'm Shannon with Empower Consulting, and I'm excited to share with you some strategies you might want to try, um, but feel free to follow me at empowerlearngrow.com where you'll receive more links to videos, free resources, or join us in our Facebook group online, uh, and that's under the Math Expressions user group. Thanks, and we hope you enjoy. So let's look at an example. I gave students 12 counters and I said, I want you to create a rectangle that uses all 12 counters. It can't have any holes in the rectangle and it has to have even uh, rows and columns. So just like we've learned with the array, in this rectangle, everything has to touch and there has to be equal rows and columns. So I set them to work with partners and here were some of the examples of what students came up with. So I had a student that did a three by four rectangle. I had a student, students that did a 2 by 6 or 6 by 2 rectangles and of course we had a 1 by 12. We had a couple of other variations of this um, and these rectangles even turned. So then we talk about well you just built a rectangle and I want to know how many square units are inside of your rectangle or that make your rectangle. So as we talk about how we already know there's 12 because that's how many I gave them, we identify it as area. Area is the space these square units are taking up. So we're calculating the amount of space. We're not calculating volume. We're not counting how many we can stack up in that amount of space. We're talking how many can cover the flat surface of these rectangles. So we already know it's 12 square units. But if I said to you in third grade, we no longer want to count by ones because I could count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That is definitely an option. And I'm gonna share that with my class because I want them to see that we could count them by ones. And I might have some students that still want to count them by ones. But I'm gonna to say, today for third grade, I really need you to tell me how we can count how many squares are in these rectangles without counting by ones. So they set to work as partners and they have their whiteboards and I have some students who start to label um, their rectangles. And so they label it um, three right here and they'd write a three, then they label it six and so they're showing me that they're counting by threes. I have others that label it, um, so that's horizontally, I have others that label it vertically and write four, eight, 12. So I get kids around the room that are doing exactly what I'm hoping, which is not counting by ones, but using count bys instead. So the one over here with our vertical triangle, or excuse me, our horizontal triangle, they would of course do six and six. So some of them already saw I just did six plus six and that's how I knew. Well, you really counted by sixes, right? So they also skip counted. Could we count by twos? So I'm showing these to students and then we're drawing on them because I really want students to see um, where, where it is that we're talking about. So I can talk all day long, but until we make it visual, some students just really don't see the threes or they really don't see the sixes. So they might say three, six, nine, 12, they might do it something like this and then I'm, I'm tracing it with my fingers, right? Oh, cause there's a group of three and there's a group of three and there's a group of three and there's a group of three. And so if I labeled this, you would say, oh, so we have three going across, right? So we have three columns and we're gonna use that language. And then I might use here, let's see a different color. Um, and I might say, but does anyone not see count by threes? Was anyone able to count by fours? And I have students, oh yeah, we counted by fours this way. Well, wh which way do you mean? Oh, you mean vertically. You mean that there were four in each column. So there were three columns, but there were four in each. So now I can count by fours. And I can say, well, there was four. And then I had another group of four, and that's eight. And then I had another group of four, and that was 12. So we could label this side four, because there were four in each row, but there were three columns. So if I wrote an equation, we lead them, of course, to think that if I count by threes or if I count by fours, isn't that just like multiplication? So some of you said you saw three groups of four. Where do you see three groups? 
And this is where students said, oh, I, I saw the three groups of four, but until I had students come up and actually count them or to trace them, I definitely had students that did not see it. They were not able to see these groups. So someone comes up and said, I see three groups of four, and then they, I had them circle it. Where do you see them? So there's one, there's two, there's three. So I had three groups of four. And that language is just super important that students see that. So other kids are like, I, I didn't see the three groups of four, I saw the four groups of three. Oh, where did you see those? Let's, let's draw those, right? So I'm gonna erase these just so that we can see the rest of my marks here, okay? And so they said, oh, I saw three groups of four, or I saw four groups of three, rather. And so I said, well, where are four groups of three? So you're telling me, or I could say four groups of three. And that's when they said, oh, see, they're right here. There's a group, there's a group, there's a group, there's a group. Let's count the groups. One, two, three, four. But until we trace them and we explicitly show them, again, I found students that had a hard time seeing those different groups. So we know that three groups of four, where I count by four three times, or four groups of three, where I count by three four times, will still give us our total number of square units, which is 12. The area of this rectangle is 12 square units. So we look at the next example. But these kids did it differently. So um, how would they write their equations? And we would say, oh, because they had two rows, so I could label this two, and they had six um, columns, so we'd label this six. Let's generate our equations. Who sees two groups of six? So if I were to write an equation, this says you see two groups of six. Where do you see them? We have someone come up, they trace them, there's a group, there's a group. Okay, there's two groups of six. Um, what about then you tell me that we can do six groups of two? So where do you see six groups of two? Again, who can come up and actually show them, trace them, draw them? Oh, there they are, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you might think, oh, well, this is so easy, Shannon and my kids would get this, but what I'm finding in every classroom I'm in is it's not as easy as we think it is. So we keep making assumptions that kids know that they can make an equation six by two or six times two, and they know the commutative property, they know we can just switch it. But when I say, okay, you can switch it to six times two, but that now means there's six groups of two. Where is that visually that that's where students are like, oh, I don't actually know where it's at. I don't see it, I just know you can do that. So we're trying to make that extremely explicit, that when we count the squares inside, how much space this takes up, I can either count by the rows or I can count by the columns. So this leads me to my next statement of, we have to be really um, intentional here about what our um, expectations are for language, right? So I might say, let's see, let's just get rid of this. Thanks for bearing with me. And I would say, well, I know that it's rows. Okay, so actually let's write, let's write number four. We'll do four times three. And you'll have to forgive me for having really great mouse handwriting. Okay, so it's four groups of three. So we say four groups of three. Four groups of three. Okay, so that's what that multiplication sign means, is it means um, of. So then once we get to of, we can do, or we can say it's rows. So let's switch our language because now, up until now, we've been okay with four groups of three because it's been equal groups. But now we're changing, or we can say it's really four rows of three. Or we can say, or it's four columns of three. Or we write it the other way. We have three times four. Well, what does that really mean? It means three groups of four, and this always means of, or it means three rows of four, so I'm counting by fours, or it means three columns of four. So if I continue to make these language frames here, as I, I taught this lesson recently, um, in a third grade classroom and afterwards when we, oh, we spelled that right, when we um, debriefed it, we talked about how these language frames would probably really be very helpful to them because we can keep saying groups of, and I want them to see the groups when we are in 
um, these pictures. I want them to see where the groups are still existing, even though we're in the area model, but we also really need students to know the grows and columns language now and how that is different when we apply it to the area model. So this is all well and good when we're talking about um, square units and how that is the space that's being taken up and that's what area is. So we built some more rectangles, we labeled our rectangles, we counted that we was not counting by ones, we created equations, we identified our equal groups, rows and columns, but then we get to that really fun skill of the distributive property. And the distributive property um, is just a bit more complicated. So let's go to that. And as we get there, we see that we have here the same rectangle, right? So we have a rectangle, uh, it's actually different from the ones we just showed you. It's a rectangle that used 18 counters. And I said, build a rectangle. And so here's something that someone did and they built their rectangle. And then I said, we could label it six by three, right? We all know that we could do six columns and three rows. We could do six groups of three, or we can see three groups of six. Either way, that's gonna help us find the area of this rectangle. But what if you're like me and you don't really like sixes? Like even if you put a six up here, counting by sixes is not very friendly and I'm not very good at it. So couldn't I take my rectangle and split it? And so I just asked students to take this rectangle and split it wherever they wanted to, where they now had two rectangles. So let's just say for argument's sake, that we get someone who does this. They decide to split it. And what I want you to know is when they use this break apart drawing, they do that in the earlier grades too. They just do it with numbers or with counters to show the two different parts. So the total is still here. I still have 18 counters. I'm just splitting it into two pieces. My total's not changing just where I count them is. So I'm gonna split my rectangle and now I'm gonna move that aside. So kids move that aside and I, now I say, do you agree that you have two rectangles? And they said, yes. And I said, now move them back together, right? They move them back together. Do you have one rectangle now? Sure. Is it the same amount of space regardless of where you split them? And I need them to experience moving them back and forth to decide that we didn't actually add any rectangles or um, uh, squares, excuse me. We didn't take away any squares. We just split it apart. Okay, so sometimes when we have very concrete students or students who are early numeracy levels, they, they think that we actually took some rectangles or squares away. We didn't take any away, we just broke this rectangle apart. Okay, so now I would say, I want you to write an equation about rows and columns, about groups of, for each of these. I have five of those columns and I have one, one, two, three rows. So I, again, I think they need to see this and they need to trace them over and over again. One, two, three, four, five columns or three rows. One, two, three. So I have five here, but how many do I have over here? I have one column, but I have one, two, three rows. So if I were to look at this, I would say I had six boys and girls, but I just, I was six all the way across. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six. But I didn't like six, so I really split it into a group of five and one. Push it back together and let's make sure it's six. And we'd push it back together and we would count it again. Right, so oh, it's still six, let's split it. But this time, now I have my three and this is where the distributive property comes in. What didn't change? What didn't change is the number of rows. The three didn't change. So that means on this rectangle, I have three by five, and this rectangle, I have three by one. So my equation here could be three groups of five, or three rows of five, and this could be one, um, three times one, or three groups of one. So what didn't change? It was the three. The three has to now multiply times the five, and the three has to multiply times the one. So when I look at my original, um, problem here, let's erase this, let's look at our original problem. Our original problem was, let's say, uh, three times six. So what you did, boys and girls, is you decided that six was not a friendly number, so you broke your rectangle into a three, or a five and a one. You broke that six. The three did not change. So now, instead of doing three times six, we're gonna distribute that three, and it's gonna be three times five, and three times one. 
So three times five, we counted by five three times and we got 15. Five, let's change our colors, you can see that. Five, 10, 15. Then you did three groups of one and you counted by ones. One, two, three, we got three. The area of this rectangle was five square units. The area of this, or 15 square units, the, rectangle, the area of this rectangle was three square units. Well, I am I finished? What if I push these back together? How many square units do I have all together? And that's where we see that 15 plus three equals 18, which is the same as three groups of six being 18. So this is what they have to prove to each other over and over and over again. Um, if I were to show you one more and look here, we would say, okay, so what if I did this with just numbers, which I would say in third grade, we're not ready to do it with just numbers. Um, we are needing to do it um, with blocks or with graph paper, um, draw the rectangle, label the rectangle, right? We're, we're ready to do those things. So let me get this screen ready for us. Okay, so now we're on this screen and I would say, so really what you said is we had three times six. And I know that in the area model, if I were to actually build that, okay, I'd have something like this, but I don't wanna count those and I also don't wanna count by sixes. So I'm gonna split my six into something that's friendly. And what I like is five and one. So if I were to split this, I would now split my rectangle into something that's more friendly. So if this used to be six, this was three, and I don't like my six, I'm gonna split it so now, it's a really bad rectangle, go with it. Um, now I have five and one. So now I have this rectangle and I have this rectangle. I have two rectangles and I'm gonna split them apart and then put them back together. So now I have three times five as one rectangle and I have three times one as a second rectangle and boys and girls, when I push them together, Am I adding them, subtracting, or multiplying? And we should say we're adding, we're just putting them back together. So I know that three times five equals 15, and three times one equals three. What do I need to do with those totals? I need to add them. So three times five equals 15, plus three times one equals three, and that equals 18. So I think one of the biggest things here is that is students need an, an experience building it, breaking it apart physically before we can take them to something like graph paper where now they draw it and they split it or now they get a picture on a workbook and they split it. It's almost too hard to see what they're doing. If they can build it and put it apart, break it apart, they're going to have more success with this skill. So I hope, you, uh, hope that helps everyone with the area model and the distributed property. Um, this is Shannon Keebler with Empower Consulting, and don't forget to visit the website at www.empowerlearngrow.com or post your questions in our Facebook user group, uh, Math Expressions User Group. I'd love to hear from you.